Welcome back to educator.com. This is the second set of lessons on the nervous system, specifically the brain. The adult brain is composed of a hundred billion neurons, which is amazing to think about. That's a lot of cells. In the first few years of life, you actually lose a lot of brain cells. Think of it this way. Uh, a baby, their brain is like a giant untamed bush. And you don't need all of those little leaves and all of those little branches to have the bush, you know, look nice and serve a purpose. So imagine that the baby brain undergoes a lot of pruning. You kind of clip certain parts off that aren't necessarily needed, and it becomes this nice functional shape with compartmentalized parts. So actually, uh, proportionally, baby brains have a lot more neurons than they need. And by the time you get into your adult life, you're not really making uh, hardly any neurons anymore. The ones you have are the ones you're going to use until the end of your life. The brain is a part of the central nervous system, and we're going to abbreviate that in the future as the CNS. And the central nervous system, unlike the peripheral nervous system, contains the brain and spinal cord. It's literally central. Brain, spinal cord going down your back in the middle. In addition to just your neurons that make up a lot of your brain, you're also going to have what are called neuroglia. And these are specialized kinds of neurons that don't do just the regular signaling, that they don't just do the sensory and motor part of how the CNS works with your body. The first one is oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes came up in the previous set of lessons regarding how neurons work. So if you remember Schwann cells being those myelin sheaths wrapping around neurons in your peripheral nervous system that branch off from your spinal cord and brain, oligodendrocytes, they make those wrappings inside of the central nervous system. So they help insulate and make saltatory conduction possible in the brain. Astrocytes, uh, they maintain the blood-brain barrier. They have a lot of functions, but I find this the most intriguing, that astrocytes, which kind of look like little stars, um, that's why they're called astrocytes. Looks like there's like little kind of beams extending from their little cell body astrocytes maintain the blood-brain barrier. And interestingly enough, your bloodstream, not everything in there is able to go into your brain. It's a protective mechanism, which is very important. And actually, um, some drugs introduced into the bloodstream, they stay out of the brain uh, and they affect other organs, other nerves outside of the central nervous system. And then other things can pass through. One of the many other functions of your blood-brain barrier is protecting your brain from certain microbes, certain parasitic worms. And interestingly enough, there is actually a kind of parasitic worm I've heard of that has evolved the ability to dissolve the blood-brain barrier. So it actually does end up inside a person's brain if it gets into their body. Um, microglia is another kind of neuroglia. And think of microglia as like the, the trash men, the, 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 the trash compactors of the brain. They're kind of like a, a macrophage would be in your bloodstream, a, a, an eater of cell debris. So they go around doing what's called phagocytosis, where they grab stuff outside of the cell, uh, outside of themselves, like let's say it's, uh, it's waste that's accumulated. Um, it might be some kind of foreign invader that got in there and it shouldn't be there. So they're cleaning up the trash in your central nervous system. And finally, the ependymal cells, you're going to find these more often around the ventricles, which are the little hollow cavities. You'll see more about those in the future on this presentation. Uh, they're like little holes, little cavities inside the brain. And the central canal, another cavity that you're going to find in the spinal cord, you would find these cells adjacent to those spaces deep within the central nervous system because they help produce what's called cerebrospinal fluid. And they help regulate it and kind of monitor it in case something goes wrong. And they, and they do help uh, produce more of it if it's needed or produce less of it if there's already plenty. When it comes to brain development, uh, you start small. If you look inside of a, of a tiny little uh, embryo, on a microscopic level, you have what's called a neural tube that first develops. And it's just very simple sets of neurons that are lined up and there's a hollow uh, section in the middle. So it is like a tube. That tube ends up getting little 
pockets. You can call them brain vesicles if you want. So at three weeks, let me actually color code this for you. You would see three main sections. And up here, this is the anterior part towards the front. And back here is going to be the posterior part. Up at the anterior part, you would call this first bump the prosencephalon. Prosencephalon. And this word cephalon is going to be the suffix, the ending of all of these little areas. So prosen, pro meaning before, like prologue, is up at the front. The next part I'm going to do in green is actually going to be called the mesencephalon. And just for the sake of time and making it simpler, I'm just going to write mesen. It has cephalon after it, of course. And then finally, at the back end, the posterior part, this is the rhombencephalon. And that's at three weeks. Uh, usually before a woman even knows she's pregnant, this has already happened. Prosencephalon, mesencephalon, rhombencephalon. At six weeks, it gets a little bit more developed and expanded. So I'm going to still use black for what happens to this anterior vesicle. It actually becomes two areas. It grows into what's called the diencephalon and telencephalon. Diencephalon and the telencephalon. Next up, you're going to see the telencephalon actually gets to be more like a T. It actually will expand on the sides here. And if you use your imagination, kind of tilt your head to the side, if this expands horizontally, you can see how it looks like the top of a T. That's how I remember it. The middle part, called the mesencephalon, just stays the mesencephalon. And actually, the mesencephalon is a part of the adult brain. So this is not going to take on a different name as we go to um, the parts of this um, uh, brain tube, if you want to call it that, up until birth. The rhombencephalon does become uh, a couple of other areas, and there's a trick to remembering these areas. This is the metencephalon, and this is the myencephalon. The way that I remember the back end of this is it's alphabetical. Mes n with an s, met n t comes after s, and then myen, so s t, and then doesn't even go to e, it goes m y. So these are in alphabetical order. That's how I remember them from the middle part to the posterior portion. And then we're going to jump ahead way further than at six weeks. We're going to jump to 40 weeks, which is the approximate amount of time that it takes uh, for a baby to develop and then be born. You're going to see some names that you probably have seen before having to do with brain anatomy. So the front gets a lot bigger. Um, I'm not even doing it justice how big this gets. The telencephalon becomes the entire cerebrum. The cerebrum in an adult brain or a newborn baby brain is that recognizable part with all the wrinkles on the surface. That's a lot of brain tissue. So this becomes what's called the cerebrum. This is still the diencephalon. And later on in this presentation, you'll see the diencephalon is just deep to what's going on in the cerebrum. The mesencephalon stays the mesencephalon. That's like an area between the diencephalon and the brain stem. So this is still the mesen. The metencephalon becomes two parts that are kind of in the um, inferior slash posterior parts of the brain. This becomes the pons, you'll hear about that more later, and the cerebellum. Cerebellum actually means uh, mini or little brain in Latin because it's kind of a, a modified version of the word cerebrum. And then last, we're still using blue, this last part here becomes the medulla oblongata, which is a major portion of the brain stem leading to your spinal cord. So by the time a baby is born, a lot has come of this initial simple 
uh, neural tube. Uh, these brain vesicles become well established and enhanced as time goes on. When we look at the superficial brain structure uh, in an adult, or a young kid for that matter, um, on the superficial part, what you're looking at here, we're actually looking at a top view, superior view down on the cerebrum. Here's the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere. You're not gonna actually see pink, green, and blue. Um, this is uh, color-coded so you can see the different lobes, which we're gonna cover in a little bit. But on the outside, they nickname it gray matter. It's darker. If you cut into the brain and look deeper, you're gonna see a greater proportion of white matter. The gray matter tends to be more of the parts of neurons that are cell bodies. And what makes it gray is all the cell bodies compacted together, the nuclei, which are slightly darker, all of those together give it a slightly darker appearance. On the other hand, the white matter that tends to be deeper in, the, the connecting parts that get the parts of the brain together and signaling each other, that's more white. And the white comes from more axons. Remember, the axons are those long parts that are the signaling parts for neurons to communicate with another neuron or another part of the body. So that white comes from the myelin sheets. And in this case, you're going to see a lot of those oligodendrocytes um, covering those parts of the axons. And that has more of a white appearance. Convolutions are the technical terms for the wrinkles. Um, people say, you know, every time you learn something, uh, you get a new wrinkle in your brain. Uh, that, that's an oversimplification and kind of a cartoony way to put it. It's not like, oh, I just learned something new, bing, and then a wrinkle just magically appears at that moment. Um, there is some truth to it because the more wrinkles you have, the more neural tissue you're fitting within your skull. Think about the surface of this having no wrinkles. That just means way less surface area. So you can compact a lot more neural tissue by folding it up and having it folded in this, in this very uh, nice way. Um, so yes, as, as you do, um, as your brain grows and as you have um, neurons being made and then other neurons dying off because they're not needed, they're not as important, you're going to have uh, wrinkles established and maintained. A gyrus is basically a ridge or a bulge. So the gyrus, we're gonna color code that red. Here's a gyrus right here, that's a bulge. Here's another bulge. Uh, this gyrus here that extends in this red part, that actually has a, a very specific name. It's called the precentral gyrus because this black line here is called the central sulcus. So because it's in the front of it, they actually call this the precentral gyrus. On the other hand, this right here, this gyrus is called the post-central gyrus because it's just behind um, the central sulcus. Plural for gyrus is gyri, G-Y-R-I. Uh, a lobe is probably a more familiar term. Um, all of this green area is a lobe. And this is specifically the uh, parietal lobe. Uh, the red ones are the frontal lobes. The blue ones are the occipital lobes. Uh, you can't see it in this image, but um, the temporal lobes are below. Like I mentioned earlier, a sulcus, we're going to do this in black, a sulcus is a deep wrinkle. It's a very like obvious um, ridge, or, or sorry, um, not ridge, uh, an obvious kind of sinking in. Um, if, if the ridges are the gyri, in between them, you can call that a sulcus. So it's, it's a shallow groove. It's not very, very deep. Uh, that's a fissure. So a fissure, we'll do that one in purple, is like a sulcus, but, but way deeper, like a ditch. Here is one of the biggest fissures in the brain. This is called the longitudinal fissure. And that's the obvious barrier that separates the two sides of the cerebrum. And then finally, the cerebral cortex, you're looking at it. The outer few millimeters of gray matter that's surrounding the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. You have a lot of neurons there, a lot of mental processing, and that's where all of those human things we recognize on a daily basis uh, come from. Um, you have a lot of higher processes going on there at the cerebral cortex level.
So when we look at the cerebrum as a whole, it is the higher brain. Uh, it's the most obvious part uh, of, of brain anatomy when you look at it. This image you're seeing here is actually uh, an fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance imaging picture of my brain. So we're looking at my brain. This is um, a sagittal section. So it's as if like we took a slice right through here uh, and you could see my profile there. Here is the cerebrum, all of that. And here is the deeper parts. Um, we mentioned diencephalon earlier. This is the diencephalon right in there. Here's the pons, medulla, cerebellum. But all of this, the majority of the brain is the cerebrum. And actually this image, it's like you cut straight through that longitudinal fissure. The corpus callosum, which you're gonna hear more about later, is this white strip. And that's hundreds of millions of neurons, specifically axons, because it's white, that are connecting the two sides of the cerebrum. So the way that the left and right hemispheres communicate is through this little white strip. And the cerebrum is divided into lobes, as I mentioned earlier, the frontal lobe up front, it's a, it's a large lobe, parietal, uh, kind of off to the side up top, temporal lobes, you can't see them in this image, um, they're on either side here. If you were seeing the actual left side of the intact brain or the right side, they'd be visible. And the occipital lobe tucked back here. So the frontal lobe, this is a superior view. You could see they're, they're quite significant. You've got the left side and the right side of the frontal lobe. The frontal lobes are involved in intelligent thought, planning, sense of consequence, and rationalization. These are the parts of the brain that really make you intelligent. Um, so if you're thinking and you're tapping here, you're, you're tapping the part that's gonna help you either solve the problem or come up with an intelligent answer. The prefrontal cortex is actually the very, very front part of this frontal lobe. And that's where most of that intelligent stuff is going on. The example of Phineas Gage is, is a really good way to think about what the frontal lobe does. Phineas Gage was a railway worker uh, back in the 1800s, and there was this freak accident that happened when they were laying down track. They had an explosion um, that had to do with like getting stuff deep in the ground to hold the rail down, and there was a misfire, and this hot rod just went through his head. It actually didn't hit any major arteries. It missed what, have, what would have made him blind. Uh, it missed a lot of areas, but it went straight through the frontal lobe and out the top of his head. And if you're wondering, well, why didn't he bleed to death? The heat from that thing that rocketed through his head just carterized, just kind of sealed shut blood vessels with all that heat. So yeah, I'm sure he was in some kind of hospital for a little while, but he lived. And this was the first time in recorded medical history that we know of in which somebody had just damaged their frontal lobe and that's it. So Phineas before the accident was a polite gentleman. He showed up on time to work. Uh, he had a great personality. People liked him. And after the accident, people commented that Phineas was not Phineas anymore. Uh, he tended to curse a lot more. He tended to show up late for work. Uh, those things that made him who he was in terms of recognizing a responsibility, um, having intellectual responses, caring how his actions impacted other people, that was gone. So think about the frontal lobe as something that, that made Phineas who he was. And once that accident happened, um, he acted more like kind of an uncivilized person. The primary motor cortex is tucked back in the posterior section. So the motor cortex here and here, that actually controls the muscles of your body. So along this ridge, you actually have sections that are uh, devoted to moving the arms, moving the fingers, uh, moving your legs, moving your torso, your back. And, and Really, the initiation of all of those movements comes from this ridge and this ridge. And remember, it's called precentral gyrus because it's in front of that central sulcus. And the amazing thing is the amount of tissue that's devoted to your fingers and your mouth is proportionally larger than you would expect. You know, your legs and your back 
are, are large proportionally in your body. But the actual sections of this primary motor cortex, the initiation of the motor movements of the back and the legs, is, is significantly smaller than your fingers and your mouth. But think about the really precise movements you need to do with your fingers, or the precise movements you need to do with your lips, your tongue, and your jaw to speak, and all the things you do with your hands. There's a lot going on. So the amazing thing is they've actually made these little neural maps showing how proportionally these parts of the motor cortex um, control the muscles and all the parts of your body. Broca's area uh, is an area associated with the part of the motor cortex that controls your mouth, but the reason why it's a little bit different is Broca's area has to do with coordinating those mouth movements in a way that enables you to speak clearly. So somebody with damage to Broca's area can still make noise, they can still um, say words, but it's not in a coordinated way. Um, and of course it varies depending on how badly it is damaged. Uh, but some people with problem with the Broca's area, uh, they just, they can't find the right words or they can't speak words um, in a clear way uh, that enables other people to understand them. And in most people, this Broca's area is concentrated in the left hemisphere rather than in the right. And we're going to come back to that later about how that does impact um, certain situations. The parietal lobes, conversely, unlike the frontal lobe, have a strip that's for sensing. So remember, this, where I'm tracing over right now, that's the precentral gyrus, which allows you to coordinate muscle movements. But just on the other side of the central sulcus, you have the primary somatic cortex or somatosensory cortex. That's right here. And typically, if, if in this part here, um, you have the ability to move parts of your arm, just on the other side of that sulcus, you have the parts that allow you to feel someone actually uh, touching or something touching your arm. So all of the feelings you get, uh, something touching your lips, something touching your head, something touching your back, Whatever part of your body is being touched, even stuff inside your body that you have a sense of, those signals are coming up into these parts of the parietal lobe. And just like with the motor uh, strip or the motor cortex, the proportion of these strips that actually has to do with um, sensing stuff on your hands and sensing stuff on your lips, those stimuli are much more obvious. Um, which makes sense. As humans, we do a lot of touching with our fingers and we wanna be able to tell one object that's different from another in, in a fine-tuned way. So the proportions, yeah, for the hands and for the lips, uh, greater than the actual size of them on our body. And they, there's, there's been these interesting drawings made where they draw what would a person look like if we took the somatosensory cortex and took the proportions in there and then drew that, that individual those drawings, they have a large face, huge lips. Um, the hands are humongous. The feet are kind of big too. And the torso, the arms, and the legs are all kind of puny. But you see this person with large hands and large uh, lips because those areas are the most sensitive. And while we're on the subject of hemispheres, it is true that the left side of the body communicates with or sorry, I just said it backwards. The left side of the cerebrum communicates with the right side of the body and vice versa. The right cerebrum, uh, that hemisphere, communicates with the left side of the body. Wernicke area or Wernicke's area is an interpretive area that's mostly in the parietal lobe, uh, but it's also uh, slightly in the, uh, the temporal lobe as well. If you're wondering what this area does, it has to do with the temporal lobe a bit because the things you hear those sound waves go into your ear and the, the nerves connect what you hear uh, to the brain in the temporal lobe. And then that's how you actually, oh, I can hear it. There's an area of the temporal lobe communicating with this part of the parietal lobe and it's called Wernicke's area named after the, uh, the doctor who discovered it. Wernicke would probably be a better pronunciation. But this area allows you to hear speech as something that you can understand. So if you have damage to Wernicke's area, something that could come as a result is 
you may still understand what the word sit means. You may understand what the word here means. But if somebody said, sit here, sit here, the person with damage to Wernicke's area would be like, they, they, they wouldn't understand really what that meant when those two words together. So the ability for us to understand what words actually mean when they're strung together, that's thanks to Wernicke's area. Imagination and dreaming have a lot to do with these lobes. Uh, I've, I've read that when they analyze Einstein's brain, his parietal lobes were actually larger than the average person's brain. So maybe he had a, a genetic gift uh, more so than others in terms of understanding or visualizing uh, how the universe works. And the parietal lobe gives you a sense of where your body is in space, which makes sense because if that somatosensory cortex or somatosensory strip is telling me what parts of my body are being stimulated, uh, having my feet touching the ground and having my arms uh, touching this table that I'm at, that has a lot to do with the parietal lobe, just my body realizing where my arms are, where my feet are. If I do a headstand, um, that's going to obviously be a very different set of signals going up into my brain. The temporal lobe is mainly for hearing, but that's not all. So that's why you see auditory cortex here. And here's uh, the right temporal lobe. On the opposite side, you're going to see a very similar lobe. That's the left temporal lobe. So the auditory cortex, that's where uh, the nerves from your ears go to. And this is the one part of the brain where it's not switched. So with um, my left hand feeling something via touch, those signals are going up to my um, uh, right part of the cerebrum, the right hemisphere. But when I hear something through my right ear, that actually just, it doesn't go to the other side. It just goes straight to the right temporal lobe. And same with the left ear. The auditory association area allows you to make sense of what you're hearing. Uh, so that is communicating with Wernicke's area. Also, um, words have a, a meaning to them beyond just what uh, the definition is. There's, of course, the, uh, the connotation of what a word means. You can say things in very different ways. And if you had damage to the auditory association area, um, that inflection that people apply to different words may not make uh, entirely, uh, it may not make sense to you. The olfactory cortex uh, is the parts of the temporal lobe associated with smell. So when we talk more about smell in future lessons, you're going to see that the olfactory tracks uh, from the actual receptors that allow you to smell, they go right through the temporal lobe and they pass right by the hippocampus and plural would be hippocampi. The hippocampi have a lot to do with memory and you may have heard that of all the senses, uh, smell has the deepest, deepest connection to memory because there is truth to that. The fact that the olfactory cortex goes right next to these parts of the brain that allow you to have those long-term memories. Yeah. Uh, that's why, you know, if you, if you smell freshly baked cookies, you may immediately think about your grandmother's cookies that she made years ago. And it just triggers that response. Uh, you may smell a perfume or cologne that reminds you of somebody immediately. And so that's some examples of how smells could uh, trigger long-term memories. The occipital lobes, uh, mainly for vision. The visual cortex is the part of the, the back occipital lobe of the most posterior part of the cerebrum that actually just enables you to see. The visual association area is what's allowing you to make sense of what you are seeing. Um, you know, so if you have damage to the visual association area, you may still be able to see perfectly fine. But when I look at a sentence and I see, um, let's, let's see, I see the, the word B E D I see bed. I, I see B E D. And since I don't have a problem with my visual association area, I know that means bed, but someone with damage to this, the association area, they'll be able to see the B, see the E and see the D but not make sense of what those all mean together, uh, which would be a terrible thing. Back here, uh, this is actually a, one of those horizontal sections or uh, a transverse, transverse cross section through the cerebrum. All of this yellow stuff is the parts of the occipital lobe that are lighting up, that are actually functioning and, and using sugars and, and doing all those action potentials. 
to enable a person to see. So they've done these time and time again, um, showing how these parts of the brain are associated with seeing and then interpreting uh, what you're seeing. The corpus callosum is a strip of white matter, like I said before, that connects the two parts of the cerebrum. Here's a nice side view of what the corpus callosum is, and here's a, a frontal view. If you could look through the frontal lobes and see it, you could see that here's that longitudinal fissure, that, that deep kind of ditch between the two sides of the cerebrum's, cerebrum, sorry, the two hemispheres. But yeah, you have a connection between the two with a lot of axons, hundreds of millions of axons that are allowing the left and right side to communicate. Sometimes uh, through surgeries, doctors will actually cut through it. One of the reasons why somebody who has epilepsy, uh, seizures, who, seizures that come again and again and again, a seizure is like kind of an out of control electrical storm in a person's brain. And seizures over the long run can do a lot of harm. So they'll cut through that because somebody who gets a little, you know, seizure starting in a part of the brain on, let's say, the left side, it will jump to the other side through the corpus callosum. So if you cut off the connection, it prevents the seizure from jumping back and forth and, and creating some harmful scenarios. So in people who are epileptic, if they cut through that, you get some interesting effects because now it's not communicating as well. You don't have the left and right hemispheres kind of communicating. And here's an example. If somebody who has a, a cut corpus callosum is holding a pen in their left hand, remember the left hand, it's communications with the right hemisphere. Now the parts of the brain that have to do with naming objects, like, you know, making sense of, of words is more in the left side of, of your brain. Now that's, that has to do with this, right? The left side of the brain has to do with my right hand. So a person who holds this in their left hand with a cut corpus callosum, they'll be able to know that they're holding this, describe the object, but they're probably gonna have trouble naming it because the left hand doesn't have the signals going up to that uh, language part of the brain on the left side. Conversely, if, if they then take that object and put it in the person's hand on the right side, well now this goes up to the left part. The, your language area tends to be more in the left side. So they'll say, yeah, it's a pen. It's a pen. But then if you ask them, is this the same object you were holding in your left hand? The person probably won't be able to tell you yes or no. So that's an interesting result from cutting the connection between the left and right sides of the cerebrum. And actually, there's an interesting uh, side note here. There's one other area in the very front called the anterior commissure. And, and that commissure connects a little bit of the front parts of the cerebrum. So people who have a split corpus callosum, you still have one little area in front of it where you can have some communication. So the seriousness of what I was just talking about can vary from person to person. The limbic system is deep within the cerebrum, <clears throat> and it's actually on both sides. Um, it's, on, it's slightly on the left, slightly on the right. It's for establishing emotion, linking higher and lower brain functions, and helping with memory storage and retrieval. The amygdala is a major part of it uh, that tends to be in the deeper section. This whole red stuff colored in, that's the limbic system. So the amygdala plays a role in the fight or flight response, which you're gonna hear a lot more about uh, in future lessons that I'm gonna give you. If you had a damaged amygdala, it's gonna be hard for that person or impossible to connect emotion with a response. For instance, um, if I step out into the street and out of the corner of my eye, I see a car coming, that's going to initiate a very quick response in my body to back away. Somebody with a damaged amygdala might have some trouble with that happening. Um, recognizing that something is threatening to you is thanks to the amygdala. And that's really when the fight or flight response is gonna come into play. Something is threatening to you and the amygdala is connecting your response with the higher parts of your brain that gets you to react effectively and, and keep yourself alive. 
The cingulate gyrus or the cingulate cortex is on the top part here where I'm tracing over. And, and this part of the limbic system assigns specific steps to discern emotions. So if you showed somebody a bunch of pictures of faces and, and they have a problem with their cingulate gyri, you could show the person a picture of a face that's like this. So you could tell, since presumably you don't have trouble with that part of your brain, that I'm giving kind of a surprise or scared look. The person who has damage there looking at that part may not be able to tell you that they're scared or surprised. They may look at the open mouth and say, um, I think they're hungry because they're missing that part that, that's enabling them to look at a face and figure out what emotions that person is experiencing. And that's part of being a social being. As humans, we rely a lot on what other people are feeling or experiencing to inform us of what's going on in the environment. So limbic system, very important for keeping human beings alive. The hippocampus, also called hippocampi, if you look at the plural word, is a part of the limbic system in, in the lower areas. And it's like two little kind of nodules, two little areas uh, deep within the temporal lobes named after the seahorse. So hippocampus literally means seahorse. I guess if you use your imagination, um, maybe you might see that. But here are the hippocampi. And we're actually looking at, at an uh, inferior view of the brain here. So here's temporal lobe, temporal lobe. You can see that they're concentrated in those sections. The hippocampus has to do with getting memories. It allows the consolidation of long-term memories via long-term synaptic potentiation and a sense of time and space. Let me give you some examples. So long-term synaptic potentiation, that's a fancy term for saying that you're gonna get a set of neurons in a connected pathway staying put so that this one has the ability to stimulate this one permanently if need be. So long-term memory is because you have a neural pathway established in your brain that there's some importance to. It might have emotional importance. It might have importance for um, just remembering your phone number or remembering your address. So those things that you remember for years, you can thank the hippocampus because the hippocampus has enabled through connecting to them, enabled those parts of your brain to maintain neural pathways. Now, short-term memories, they form and they go. They form and then they go. For instance, um, if you ask me what I had for lunch on Tuesday of last week, I don't remember. Um, I could guess, but chances are I'd be wrong. There wasn't a need for me to remember what I had for lunch on Tuesday last week. Now, some people um, have a gift, have something special where they can remember every day of their life. And they call that a disorder. Uh, it, it is somewhat of a gift. But the average person, you're only going to be having long-term memories maintained when they're needed. So a short-term memory, if you have a neural network established for, um, let's say, a conversation you had that wasn't of huge importance with someone, after a day or two, that conversation, the minor details of it, you won't need that network anymore. It could be reestablished uh, for some other new experience that you just had. So the brain has a certain amount of what's called plasticity. This is an important word that will come up later. Plasticity, meaning the way that the brain is arranged is not set in stone. You can actually adjust what it's doing as your life changes over time. And that's very important. Uh, prior science from years ago, 30, 40 years ago, they really thought that the adult brain was kind of set in stone. And research lately has showed that's not true. The, the brain has a great deg degree of what's called plasticity. Uh, patient HM is the best example I could give you for how the hippocampi work. And, and when he was alive, for confidentiality reasons, he was just called H.M., uh, but his, his name, we now know, is Henry Molaison. And Henry Molaison uh, has passed away, so that's why we know more about him now. Um, he is one of the most studied patients in medical history. Years ago, decades ago, he had his hippocampi surgically removed in an operation because of uh, issues with uh, something about his brain. But the importance is that every other part of his brain was functioning properly, but he's missing the hippocampus. So that's a great way 
to study what this does. I mean, that's how we figure out what parts of the brain do. If you damage one part of it, but the rest of it's intact, you can figure out what's missing or what's different. So in patient HM and, and Henry, with the doctors that studied him for years, he wouldn't remember them. They would come in weekly and study him and he'd have to you know, be reintroduced to these people. He could remember everything up to the surgery. So you can ask him about childhood memories, um, things about his family. He would remember those completely. But once the hippocampi were removed, once they're no longer functional, that prevented him from making long-term memories that we take for granted. Um, the interesting thing is that memories have different addresses in the brain. So I don't want you to think he was completely incapable of long-term memories. It depends. The amazing thing is that with the house that he lived in after the surgery, he was still being studied uh, while he was living there with a caretaker. If you ask him to design the floor plan, he can design it exactly if you ask him to do it. And, and the theory behind that is even after his hippocampus was removed, he had walked around that house for years, every day, same house. So something else in his brain was allowing him to remember that. Um, another interesting thing about that is, I, I, I don't know if this is a tall tale. Uh, I heard this story about HM, that the doctors went in uh, one day and, and shook his hand. You know, let's say it was four doctors. They all shook his hand and introduced themselves as if he had never seen them before. A few days later, the doctors come back in, uh, shake his hand, and now one of them has one of those little buzzers, one of those shocking buzzers on their hand. So the fourth doctor shakes his hand, introduces himself, and shocks him. And he, he, of course, is disturbed by that, and maybe they all had a good laugh right afterwards. So you would think that he wouldn't remember that at all. The next time those four doctors come in, the last doctor that walks into the room still has the buzzer on his hand. So he, he meets the first three doctors, meets the first three. The fourth one comes, and HM kind of hesitated a little bit in meeting this person. So maybe some other part of his limbic system um, had allowed him to retain some kind of emotional response to that individual. And just, this just goes to show you that the brain is very complicated. Even if you're missing the hippocampus, it doesn't mean all of your long-term memories are, are, are not going to happen anymore, but the majority of it is going to be affected. The basal nuclei uh, has to do with the coordination of learned movements, and it's, it's maintaining those learned movements over time rather than initiating it. So, for instance, when you walk, the precise movements of your arms and thighs, you don't really have to think about it consciously. When you walk, your arms just kind of sway back and forth, opposite of your legs, right? When your left arm moves forward, your right leg tends to move forward, and so on and so forth. We don't even put conscious thought into it, but you can thank the basal nuclei, these, these regions deep within the brain, and you can see they're concentrated in the white matter, uh, the signaling parts, which makes sense because they're signaling these coordinated movements of your arms and legs while you're walking. Parts of, uh, of the basal nuclei are inhibited by dopamine. I brought this up earlier in a previous lesson that if dopamine is the neurotransmitter that's turning off some of these parts, if you don't have as much dopamine being released as you should, you could get some uncoordinated movements, making it hard to make precise motions. The olfactory bulbs slash tracks have to do with smelling. And this is a great image from Gray's Anatomy. We're looking at an inferior uh, diagram of the brain. These little red parts outlined there, they look like little white um, strands. They're very obvious when you, when you turn a brain underneath. You can see these two uh, parts. And they have to do with receiving smells from what are called the olfactory receptor cells and bringing those parts into the brain. These are the only nerves that go directly into the cerebrum rather than the diencephalon or brainstem. So if you think about the nerves coming from your arms, from your legs, from your eyes, they go through kind of like relay stations on the way up to your higher brain. The exception is these olfactory tracts. And they lie just inferior to the prefrontal cortex. Like I mentioned before, the very front part of the frontal lobe is called the prefrontal cortex.
The ventricles of the brain are basically cavities. If you've heard of the ventricles of the heart, the, the hollow areas within the heart, it's the same kind of uh, structure in terms of why they're named this. These are hollow cavities deep within the brain. So we wouldn't call this a ventricle up here. Remember, this is the longitudinal fissure that you can see very easily when you look down uh, on the brain from a superior view. This is a ventricle and this is a ventricle. So this is one of those um, frontal or coronal cross sections straight through uh, the cerebrum. And this gives us a good view. You can see part of um, the ventricles here. This is a, a transverse or horizontal section. So if you're wondering what do these cavities do, they have to do with generating and circulating the CSF, also called the cerebrospinal fluid. And there's actually a, a kind of uh, cell uh, known as, well, it's actually a region known as the choroid plexus that's adjacent to the ventricles. And uh, remember the uh, ependymal cells, I almost forgot the word, the ependymal cells, uh, they have to do with making the CSF and regulating it. So these ventricles, those cavities within the brain get CSF in there and then they circulate that around the outside of the brain and the outside of the spinal cord as well as inside what's called the central canal which will come up in a later lesson. But what does this CSF do? What is it? Why is it important? Well, it has a lot to do with protecting the central nervous system and helping to regulate the amount of gases coming in and out, the wastes leaving, nutrients coming in. So the, the health of the CSF impacts circulation in and out of the brain. Very important. The diencephalon is deeper than the cerebrum. So now we are done with the cerebrum. That was a lot of slides, but the cerebrum is very complicated. So if you go just deep to that, there are two regions, the thalamus and the hypothalamus, hypo literally meaning below the thalamus. And the thalamus is kind of like a relay station. It brings sensory information up into the cerebral cortex in, in a coordinated fashion. And like I said earlier, the majority of the nerves coming into the central nervous system, they have to go through the thalamus on their way up. Uh, a classic example of that is the optic nerves. The hypothalamus, which is directly inferior to the thalamus, has a lot of roles. It's just above the pituitary gland, and you're gonna see this more obviously in future lessons. Uh, if you take a cross section of the brain, there's a little thing that looks like a pea that's hanging from the base. That's the pituitary, and the hypothalamus is what is right above it. Feeding reflexes, um, salivating, um, a baby uh, making certain motions uh, during breastfeeding has to do with the hypothalamus, initiating those things. Uh, the feeding center and thirst center, you getting hungry and thirsty, the signals from the brain uh, that have to do with that come from the hypothalamus. Circadian rhythms have to do with sleep versus being awake. So typically for most humans, when the sun goes down, after that happens, you tend to get more tired, the exception being if you work a night shift. Uh, but for the average human being, circadian rhythms has to do with um, signals from the environment telling your brain it's, it's sleepy time. And then when the sun comes up, it's time to wake up. So the regulation of the circadian rhythms that have to do with, you know, uh, changing your conscious state, that's from the hypothalamus. Communication with the pituitary gland. If you remember me saying that the pituitary gland is like a little P-shaped gland hanging right below the hypothalamus, a lot of people refer to the hypothalamus as like the master of the endocrine gland. It's like the big head honcho. And the pituitary gland is kind of like it's second in command. The hypothalamus tells the pituitary gland to secrete certain hormones at certain times, and the pituitary gland impacts the other endocrine glands, causes them to release hormones. Or the pituitary gland just causes other organs uh, to be regulated. For instance, uh, the pituitary gland secretes growth hormone, so making your bones uh, elongate in the proper way uh, throughout your adolescence, that's regulated uh, via the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. And subconscious skeletal muscle control, all those movements you do that you don't have to think about, you can thank the hypothalamus. The pineal gland is the final part of the diencephalon. It's actually in the posterior portion of this area. 
it's it's like a smaller P. It's it's actually um, a similar looking structure, but it's not hanging from the brain. It's tucked in the back. This has to do with secreting melatonin, and melatonin is a neurotransmitter that actually puts you to sleep. And, and there's been a lot of studies done with um, people taking melatonin, uh, you know, pills when they go on a plane uh, to make them go to sleep. And I read a study that actually had to do with uh, uh, the placebo effect of that, uh, suggesting that the average person who takes a melatonin supplement didn't need it, uh, that the melatonin in your brain is actually enough uh, to put you to sleep naturally. The mesencephalon is just kind of uh, posterior slash inferior uh, to the diencephalon. Right here in this cross section, uh, this is actually not my head anymore, but this is another sagittal cross section straight through the corpus callosum. And you can see this M is that mesencephalon. It has a lot to do with processing visual and auditory data uh, that comes in from the eyes and ears. Your reflexive somatic motor responses are generated here. And that's fancy terminology for um, when you hear a sound or see something out of the corner of your eye and you react. So if I, if I heard something over there and I did this without even having to think about it, that's because of the mesencephalon. Um, so if, you, if your eyeballs move too uh, in, in reaction to something, it has a lot to do with the mesencephalon. And the maintaining of consciousness comes from this area. So I'm using my mesencephalon right now. Next, the pons. Same image as before. Uh, the pons is this bulge right here. That's the pons. So it's just below or inferior to the mesencephalon and just anterior or in front of the rest of the brain stem. So this links the cerebellum, which is right back here, with the other parts of the brain and spinal cord. And considering its proximity to there, it makes sense that it would do that. Uh, so the pons has a lot to do with getting communication between the higher brain and lower parts of the brain. And it's thought to play a significant role in dreaming. The medulla oblongata is the majority of the brain stem. So you can see that it is the inferior portion um, just below the, uh, the pons. So here's a side view. Uh, here is a uh, frontal view or anterior view. It contains, very important here, the cardiovascular, vasomotor, and respiratory centers. Damage to the medulla oblongata often results in a fatality because your heart rate is controlled by the cardiovascular center. The vasomotor center controls your blood pressure, the expanding and constricting of your arteries, and the respiratory center. You don't have to think to breathe. If we had to think, every time we had to breathe, our life expectancy might be a little shorter as humans. So thankfully, you can sit there, you could, you could go running and not actually have to think about breathing. You're just gonna automatically do it. Now, now that I'm talking about breathing, you're probably thinking about every exhalation and inhalation that you're taking. Uh, but without the medulla oblongata functioning properly, the heart, blood vessels, lung expansion and reduction is not gonna happen. Uh, and, and that's needed uh, to keep you alive. The reticular formation is a part of the medulla oblongata that helps regulate vital autonomic functions. And those are going to come more into play when we talk about the branches of the nervous system in future lessons and how the endocrine system also controls uh, the fight or flight response. And numerous nerves ascend, go into, up into the brain through here, which makes sense. I mean, this is the spot that signals have to go through from the spinal cord. If you continue this image down, the medulla oblongata just transitions into the spinal cord. So the signals coming from the lower parts of your body have to go through this area to get up into the brain. The cerebellum, which really means little brain in Latin, is inferior to the occipital lobe. You can see that here's the occipital lobe. It's below it and it's posterior behind the pons and medulla. I love this image here on the right because when you cut it in half, you can see this, this cool little design that almost looks like branches of a tree. And that's known as the arbor vitae, which is Latin for uh, tree of life. And that's made of white matter, very 
uh, distinguishing part of the cerebellum. And if you remember uh, from the previous lesson on neurons, that image of the neuron with all those dendrites, it looked like the most branchings a tree could have. You have a lot of those kinds of, uh, of neurons in here. And it's all about coordination of your motor function and balance. So if you're really good at a video game and you can, without even like consciously thinking of it anymore, just automatically move the arrow buttons and the other you know buttons on the side to do all the activities in the video game, if you have sort of this kind of skeletal muscle memory of doing a certain action to get to the next level, you can thank your cerebellum. If you're able to play a piano or play a guitar with two hands and get to the point where you can play a piece of music without even having to think about it, it's just your fingers just kind of know where to go, you can thank the cerebellum for that. The meninges. The meninges are wrappings around the brain and spinal cord. So it really envelops, wraps around the central nervous system as a whole. And it's around the superficial portion, the outside. It helps insulate the central nervous system and it helps regulate blood flow. Sometimes you get what's called meningitis, which I'm gonna mention again in a little bit. Um, that's an infection of these meninges. And the problem with that is if we zoom into where the meninges are, here is a part of what looks to be either the parietal bone or frontal bone. And just deep to it, you have these membranes that are right in between the skull and the brain. If you get bacteria, virus, fungus in this part of your head, your immune response to that being there is gonna create inflammation, swelling. And the problem with swelling here is that your skull is not gonna budge, but the swelling in this region is going to start pushing on your cerebral cortex and that's gonna be potentially fatal. So meningitis is one of those things that you gotta get treated as soon as possible. But besides the infections, the meninges are very important. And by the way, the singular version of this word, is not often used, but they say meninx, meninx. Uh, but I hear the word meninges a lot more because they're talking about them as a whole. There are several layers. The dura mater, is the one that's just adjacent to the inside of the skull. So the right under uh, the cranium, you've got this area called the dura mater. And then you have another layer that's just deep to that. And there's a little pocket in between the two layers of the dura mater. That's where the CSF is gonna be. So the flowing of that cerebrospinal fluid around the brain and spinal cord is gonna be within that dura mater. And then you have this area called the arachnoid between the dura mater and then the pia mater is right on top of the cerebral cortex. That's the part of the meninges that is, is directly adjacent to that gray matter of the cerebrum. And the way that I keep them straight is I think of it once again, like I've said before, in alphabetical order. Dura mater, D comes before P. So I think from top to bottom, most um, superior or, or most superficial to deep. And so it's the two layers of dura mater and then the pia. A way to remember that dura mater has two layers is D for die, meaning two, D for dura mater, meaning two, uh, whatever works. So these are the layers of the meninges that are protecting the central nervous system and helping regulate blood flow. And finally, some brain disorders and conditions. Like I mentioned previously, seizures, uh, most common in people with epilepsy, but a seizure can happen in anyone. Uh, not all is known about the origination of seizures, uh, but there's a lot of studies being done. Uh, it's kind of like an electrical storm in the brain. And the reason why, you know, the, someone with a seizure usually ends up on the ground uh, convulsing is because it's stimulating so many parts of the brain that are typically regulating motor control that it's out of control. You don't have that coordinated um, inhibition and excitation of those muscles. Uh, so it ends up you know, creating a situation where they're convulsing. A piece of advice, um, do not try to prevent someone from swallowing their tongue if they're having a seizure. When a seizure is happening, because there's an uncoordinated movement, sometimes the tongue 
can get in the way of the respiratory uh, passageways, but that's not as common as you would think. People who've tried to prevent someone from swallowing their tongue while they're seizing have gotten their they've gotten their fingers bitten off. Uh, you know, and that's, that's not something you want to do. You don't want to put your fingers in a person's mouth who can't control consciously their skeletal muscle movements because they might be biting down. What you should do is find a way to cradle that person's head. Get a pillow, get something hot, soft, or just hold their head to prevent their head from hitting something hard. And when the seizure is done, assess how they're doing. Um, moving on, concussions. Concussions uh, are fairly common, especially in sports that involve collisions. Um, car accidents are another way that someone can get a concussion. But any time that your head hits something very hard or something hits your head very hard, it can cause a brain bruise. And that's basically what a concussion is. It has to do with your head being hit so hard that all the, the meninges cushioning your brain, the cerebral spinal fluid being that nice buffer between your brain and, and, and the inside of your cranial cavity, wasn't enough. Your brain physically hit into your skull, and usually it's just damage uh, on the superficial parts of the brain that someone does recover from. Now, enough concussions over time can cause more permanent damage. Meningitis, already mentioned before, either bacteria, viruses, or funguses, fungi, I should say, can actually infect your, your meninges. Uh, the signs of meningitis happening is fever, um, you know, a sense of pain up here. It's like a really bad headache, um, confusion, kind of not a sense of what's going on. And the other one is if the person has trouble doing this, if they get a lot of pain from moving their head down to their chest, it's because they're stretching part of the meninges and that activity will cause a lot of pain. If those signs are happening, go to the emergency room. Uh, better to be safe than sorry. Stroke, also known as a cerebrovascular accident, has to do when um, arteries going up into the brain get clogged. And depending on what artery gets clogged, or arteriole, smaller artery, that's going to cut off blood flow to a, a certain part of the brain. Um, strokes can be fatal. Uh, sometimes they're not. It, it really just depends. A sign that someone has had a stroke is you get... Uh, kind of a disagreement of what the sides of the body are doing or what they're able to do because a stroke is going to happen on the right or left side. It's very rare that you'd have two strokes on the left and right side happening simultaneously. So let's say a um, person has a stroke in their left hemisphere. That's going to affect the right side of their body. So if you ask the person to smile and they only seem to be able to like lift up this part of the mouth, that's a sign they've had a stroke. Or if you ask the person to lift up both of their arms, if this arm if they just can't lift it quite as well, that's another sign that they've had a stroke and that you should take them to the hospital. Hemorrhage, this is not just in the brain, uh, but you can get hemorrhages in the brain. It's basically internal bleeding. Um, you know, you can have hemorrhages on the surface of the brain, have hemorrhages within the brain. Depending on how bad they are, they can be fatal. Um, and, and really, a, a surgery is required uh, to get rid of that bleeding. Aphasia is any time that a person has um, the inability to speak or read at, at a normal level. Uh, and that has to do with underdevelopment of those regions or, or damage of those regions because of an accident. Related to that is dyslexia. Dyslexia, I, I've heard estimates that it affects as much as 15% of children um, and it still affects adults too. Dyslexia is not something that's that's incurable. It's something that someone can get over, but it has to do with um, reading and the words not completely making sense as it does in a normal reader. So let's say the person's looking at the word pi. They may actually see EIP when they read it. And that's of course going to create some issues with understanding. Uh, there are therapies that a person can do to get to the point where they see this as they should. So it's something that, um, with work, uh, you, can, uh, you can conquer it. Disconnection syndrome is a result of, like I mentioned earlier, cutting through the corpus callosum, having the left and right hemispheres not be in communication, and having sort of that disagreement of what the left and right hands or left and right sides of the body are telling a person. Like I also mentioned earlier, there is a small area 
anteriorly connecting parts of the frontal lobes that can still be in communication, but the majority of that communication is definitely in the corpus callosum. Hydrocephalus literally means water on the brain, and this is most common in infants. If they are not regulating the amount of CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, within the brain and on the outside of the brain and spinal cord, if they're producing way too much of it, you can get this swelling, almost looking like their head is ballooning. And, and that's most common in an infant because if you saw the skeletal system lessons, those uh, uh, cranial bones are not completely fused yet. So there's a little bit of wiggle room and that buildup of CSF looks like the head is ballooning and it can be fatal if it's not treated. Parkinson's disease, mentioned earlier, has to do with uncoordinated uh, motor, motor uh, stimulation and has to do a little bit, at least a little bit, with dopamine imbalance. Um, there isn't a complete cure yet. Uh, I believe one day there will be a solid cure for Parkinson's because it's probably more than just dopamine. There are possibly genetic factors and environmental factors that have to do uh, with Parkinson's disease um, and its onset. Alzheimer's disease, um, I've heard people mispronounce this. They say old timers. Um, it's Alzheimer's and it's named after a doctor that researched it for many years. Alzheimer's disease, here's a picture that shows you what it looks like. Here's a healthy brain, one of those coronal or frontal sections through the cerebrum. And this is severe AD or Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that there's a lot of deterioration. Uh, it's going to affect the hippocampi. And that's why somebody with severe AD is going to have memory problems uh, or, or a sense that maybe they're in a, a previous time. Uh, one of my great grandparents who had Alzheimer's, uh, when you would talk to her, uh, she would think a lot about previous times as if she was still in the moment. And she would look at relatives uh, that she knew and say, oh, you remind me of this person um, as if she was stuck in a previous time. And then, of course, the cerebral cortex, you could see the outsides of the cerebrum are severely impacted. You would see kind of a wearing away of a lot of that gray matter. And that's going to gradually incapacitate somebody to the point where they're not going to be able to take care of themselves. There's a lot of research into Alzheimer's disease, identifying uh, factors that make it more likely for someone to get it. And once again, genetics has something to do with it but there may be certain environmental factors that make it more likely for one person or another to get it. And of course, as you age, the chances of AD coming into play increase. So if you look at a population of people who are in their 60s, they're less likely to, to get it. Some people in their 60s can get it, but when you look at a population in their 80s or 90s, the incidence of Alzheimer's goes up significantly. Thanks for watching educator.com.